how one small country decided to fight for survival. We spent the night before battle with Israeli commanders in the desert, so our viewpoint is naturally there. On this last night of peace, they knew already the die was cast. A week later, the commander, two of these girls and 50 men were dead. <laughs> Israel struck aside the guns pointing at Israel's head. The guns were Russian and held by Arabs. The biggest tank battle in history destroyed hundreds of new Russian tanks. But to achieve such a fantastic victory, Israel had first to destroy her enemy's growing armada of powerful jets. Israel's fate depended on outworn equipment. Their obsolescent jets had to destroy Arab air power based on superior Russian-built aircraft. The newest of Russian fighters were shot down by an Air Force much smaller and technically inferior. These are the first pictures of the new supersonic Russian MiG-21s shot down in actual combat. The Egyptians fell back under the swift hammer-like blows. Israel had 10 days to establish a decisive victory before the sheer weight of Arab numbers had time to turn the tide. By the sixth day, the Arab forces had collapsed on three fronts. The contingency plan for this campaign was called Strike Zion. It involved every man, woman and child in Israel. Inside the United Nations, the delegates took their sides. Outside, the demonstrators reflected Western public reaction. In Ottawa, the protests were aimed more at the Russians, who were blamed for filling Arab minds with fear of Israel. In Cairo, the first reaction to war was one of fantasy. Ron Chester reported to CBC that Egyptians were sure they had already defeated Israel. This is war with Israel. Perhaps 300 stood near the Cairo radio building, and then with startling suddenness, they erupted into a wild demonstration of joy. 23 Israeli planes, someone yelled. 23 planes shot down. Two or not, it was enough to trigger a tremendous surge of emotion up and down the street. Then another cue from the announcer, 24 planes, and another demonstration. Someone said, no, not 24, 42 planes, 42 planes. And just before we came on the air, it was 44 Israeli planes down, with two Egyptian planes reported shot down. But the announcer said the pilots were safe. But in fact, here in Cairo, no one seems to know anything for sure. Ron Chester, BBC News, Cairo. In Moscow, the party rabble-rousers tried to whip up feeling against Israel. 
This was partly to pacify the Chinese, who claimed Russian communists were frightened of a war against imperialism in the Middle East. The Chinese communists called for a revolutionary war of liberation, like the one in Vietnam. The communist bloc had provided Egypt with weapons and propaganda and nothing else. Israel smashed what she regarded as the real enemy, Russian military power. Russian propaganda misled the Arabs and Russian tanks and jets gave the Arabs a false sense of military confidence. When it came to the crunch, the Russians were willing to fight on the diplomatic front only. Before June 5, the balance of arms made Israel look like a David against the Russian-backed Goliath. 14 Arab states had 631,000 men under arms and more and better tanks and jets. Israel, about the size of the Niagara Peninsula, was hopelessly outnumbered. For 11 years, Egypt had been building her strength with Russian arms. Syria, too, became an instrument of Russian policy. Between them, Egypt and Syria acquired Russian weapons, including 2,000 tanks, 700 military jets, worth $2 billion, $100 million. Egypt mobilized her reserves earlier this year when Russia spread rumors of an Israeli military buildup. The Russian motive was probably to unify the Arab world. President Nasser was looked upon favorably by Moscow, and lately his popularity in the Middle East seemed to be dropping. He had always refused to recognize Israel, and he used the tiny state as a focal point for Arab grievances. President Nasser was well known to Israeli leaders. They had once regarded him with optimism as the young colonel who, in 1952, ended imperialist influence and launched Arab socialism. But as time passed, he became increasingly the prisoner of his own words. In recent months, Egypt had faced serious economic difficulties and President Nasser's reputation went into a small decline. The Russians saw the Egyptian president as a means to unify an Arab world where Moscow's influence was strong. So the Russians claimed Israel was preparing a preventive war and suddenly President Nasser rose to the heights again on a wave of renewed anti-Jewish fervor. The leaders of Syria and Jordan came to Cairo to discuss closer military ties, apparently also convinced by the Russians that Israel was preparing for another war. In Syria, heavily armed by the Russians, President Nasser was said to be hiding behind the United Nations as an excuse to leave Israel alone. Russian leaders came to tell Nasser of their support, and their visits were widely publicized, and propaganda against Israel reached a fever pitch. The claim was made again that Arabs were in a state of war with Israel, always had been and always would be. The attacks against the Jews bolstered Nasser's claim to lead the Arab world. Russian leaders seemed to believe none of this would lead to a real conflict. Russian arms continued to pour into Egypt in a frantic bid to counterbalance communist China, who claimed Peking was the true leader of revolution. The Russians, in their propaganda haste, seemed to miscalculate and underestimate the determination of Egypt to go to war against Israel if provoked sufficiently. The demands to destroy Israel and to kill the Jews were watched on Egyptian television by the residents of Tel Aviv, who had no TV station of their own. Half the regular soldiers of Israel spoke Arabic and understood a natural Arab inclination to exaggerate but now they wondered if Arab leaders really did mean it when they promised, as Nasser now did, a total war against Israel. 
visitors to the president's palace were told a different story. President Nasser said it was necessary to speak in extreme terms because this was the Arab way, and he was asked on the eve of war if he would attack Israel, but he turned the question round. If somebody attacks you, yeah. what would be your reaction? Somebody attacks us, we will react. React in war means destruction. And if they don't attack, will you let them alone? Yes, we leave them alone. We have no intention to attack Israel. Aren't you supposed to be goading them into taking action against you? Well, this is a case, the case of the Arabs of Palestine. You know, here in this part of the world, the Arab country, no one, no one accepts uh, this idea about forgetting all the past, all the... Uh, 20 years and close our eyes and uh, leave everything as it is. We insist about the rights of the Arabs of uh, Palestine. Yes. What about um, the other great power, the Soviet Union? She has sent you a lot of messages of support, but I think uh, there's a very strong feeling that if uh, there were a real crisis, a military crisis, she wouldn't help you. You know, we uh, really thank the Soviet Union because of their support and because they realized the rights of the Arabs, the rights of the Palestinians, the case of the Arabs. They are not committed with the Jewish voices for election. And it, it was not at all our object to have confrontation between the Soviet Union and the United States. We want peace in the world. We don't want war. Whatever NASA said to Western visitors, he now moved seven divisions of troops and tanks into the Sinai, where they pressed hard on Israel's borders. Arabs shelled the borders whenever they felt like it. Israel had little defense, and in Syria, the Arab gunners stuffed an entire mountain with guns like quills in a porcupine. Farmers became soldiers in the frontier settlements. They lived for 19 years under destructive shell fire from the nearby Arab gun emplacements. Since 1951, we uh, suffered a lot from uh, the security uh, position here. And uh, I would say that uh, about a couple of hundred people were injured or killed through the sabotage and terrorism of the Syrian uh, soldiers or other pe people that came from Syria. April the 7th, we got uh, very heavy shelling. They have very heavy artillery in a distance of about uh, 15, 17 miles. More than 2,000 Israelis died this way. Peaceful farmers, struck by shells or blown up by mines and booby traps. This shell fire took on a new significance when Egypt demanded the United Nations withdrawal from Gaza six weeks ago. Israel became established in 1948 as a refuge for Jews from Europe, and the Suez campaign in 1956 had inflicted defeat on Egypt, but increased Arab determination to wipe out the new state. The Gaza Strip was a buffer between Israelis and Egyptians. Suddenly, Nasser wanted Canadians and other United Nations forces out. There was nothing to stop the build-up of a thousand Egyptian tanks in the Sinai along Israel's border and south of Gaza. In Cairo, talks took place with the United Nations Secretary General, Uthman. His quick agreement to the UN withdrawal from Gaza caused some critics to call the conflict that followed Uthman's war. President Nasser seemed beyond further discussion. He appeared on television talking with Egyptian pilots, the so-called volunteers of death, who were earmarked to fly against Israel. This is how the pilots and Nasser appeared to Israeli viewers. <laughs> 
whose son found Nasser set upon a dangerous game of brinksmanship. The president publicly endorsed the Palestine Liberation Army and said he would close the Gulf of Aqaba. Israel's trade with Asia and Africa depended on free passage of her ships from Elat through the Gulf. By moving forces into the Sinai and then applying pressure at Sharm el Sheikh on the Strait of Tehran, Nasser could strangle new Israeli industries. Elat was the Israeli port which suffered from the blockade as much as if the harbour had been bombed by Egyptian planes. For years, Israelis patiently built up Elat where once there was nothing but burning desert. They wanted trade with the new developing nations, and they shipped cargoes down the Gulf to Asia and Africa. There was no alternative because Egypt had closed the Suez Canal to Israeli ships a long time ago. Into Elat came the vital oil supplies from Iran, and by blockading the Gulf, Egypt threatened to ruin Israel's economy and at the same time starve her of fuel. Elat's oil refineries had been a symbol of the Israelis' achievement in filling the desolate emptiness with new industries. The crisis confronted Parliament with the harsh decision to launch a preemptive strike to get in the first blow. A coalition government was quickly formed, old political enemies sat together, and the more militant men at last found an audience for their warnings, men like General Diane, who believed Israel to be faced with extinction. The Prime Minister, Levi Eshkol, was a man of peace. Eshkol came to Israel as a farmer's boy from Russia. He was strongly opposed to General Diane and the theory of a preventive war. Now he too arrived at the conclusion war was unavoidable. On May 14th, the Egyptian dictator began a massive build-up of troops and armor, uh, which grew from day to day until by early June, an offensive array of some 100,000 troops and a 1,000 uh, tanks and other equipment was lined up on uh, Israel, uh, on Israel's uh, south, uh, on Israel's southern and uh, southwestern border. On May 17th, he ordered the immediate evacuation of the UN emergency force. On May 20. Three, Nasser set up a battery of short guns at the entrance to the Gulf of Aqaba and announced that henceforth uh, this international waterway would be closed to Israel bound shipping. On May 30th, Nasser and on May 30th, Nasser and uh, King Hussein of Jordan signed an uh, aggressive military pact. A few days later, joined by Iraq, whose uh, avowed aim was the tightening of the news around Israel's neck. Now at last, the citizen generals took charge. General Abraham Yoffa was in peacetime a nature conservationist. He visited his reserve units, now assembling in the desert. A week earlier, General Yoffa was lecturing in Jerusalem on the protection of wildlife. Now he sought the protection of Israel itself. With the quiet composure of a practiced drill team, Israel's citizen army mobilized to the broadcast of code signs. The generals knew they lacked sufficient arms to risk a long war. A decisive victory had to be won against Egypt within a few days. Before their 300 jets ran out of fuel and spare parts, before their 1,000 tanks ran out of supplies. Each general commanded a force he would personally lead against the enemy. Each force was self-sustaining, and the reservists wore a variety of eccentric uniforms. Their vehicles were private cars, ice cream wagons, baker's trucks. When their food, water, and weapons gave out, more would have to be captured from the enemy. Behind the generals stood old underground fighters like the new minister without portfolio, Menachem Begin. He took the strong view Israel must strike down the tormenting Arabs, whatever the cost, because the alternative was to suffer another organized massacre of the Jews. We are surrounded by enemies who proclaim openly 
before the whole world. They, they want to destroy our country and our people. And therefore, the problem is of how to defend ourselves and how to avoid this horrible design, most horrible since the smoke of the chimneys of Auschwitz disappeared in Europe. General Diane, pulled out of retirement to become defense minister, was the hero of the 1956 campaign. He was a farmer, an archaeologist, but he was also the architect of the strategy soon to be tested. He'd lost all confidence in international willingness to protect Israel. General, is it correct to assume from your replies that you personally have lost confidence in diplomacy or the United Nations to lift the threat from the Arab world? No, well, what? Correct. Well, I, I would be uh, glad and surprised if they do that. But uh, I do not hope or really uh, expect or even want other people to fight and get killed for us. That's very clear. Now, if anything can be achieved through diplomatic ways, that's by, by, by far better, by far, far better. Now, what really happened during the last week was that it collapsed, all the arrangements that were made 10 or 11 years back were collapsed. Now, whether one can get out of that very helpful, I doubt very much. So, of course, like everybody, what we see now, we, are, we, we watch now the collapse of international arrangements. The next day on June the 4th, Israel dug in. It was the last frantic weekend of peace. Nobody believed any longer that the United Nations or Israel's so-called allies would come to Israel's assistance. Egypt had moved troops to points only 50 miles from Tel Aviv, and these troops came from the Yemen, where poison gas had been used. The Russian gas equipment was found by Israeli intelligence, and the government was convinced Egypt would use gas. Gas masks were purchased from Germany, but the irony was lost on these children. They took air raid drills in their stride. But every jet that whined overhead was an ominous reminder that war was now very near. I wanted very much to go now also to the front, but they didn't take me because they said I'm a teacher and my job is to be with the children here. Because we have to show them one and for all that this country belongs to us and to nobody else. I think here the girls are very, very near to, the, to all this life, to the army, to the, to the war. We are very looking forward, we are very close to it. When I was in uh, Buchenwald, in a prison, I have a family, I have a country, I can fight for nothing, and now I have a family, I have a country, I have for, for what to fight. How long have you been preparing for a war against the Arabs? We trained uh, all the time. We trained and we, we are prefer, prepared always uh, for a defense war and for a tactical war. All the young men and women were now at their emergency stations in the great emptiness of the desert. Never can a nation have been so reluctant to shatter the peace of the night. Oh. 
first indication here in Tel Aviv of fighting happened shortly before 8 o'clock, when air raid sirens sounded for about half an hour. At about the same time, a military spokesman announced that at that moment, the enemy was being engaged in the air. He did not say where, but it was not over Tel Aviv. No one wanted to come with me to the theater. And I said to them, it's better to sit a little while for nothing and to go up again. After we have been down, the soldiers had to really stay to the house. Every man of, uh, of army age was not at home. You could see only children, aged people and women. And I only can express my admiration to their behavior, quietness, lack of any sign of panic and uh, uh, you will laugh maybe but the cinemas were open and full with people everyone we haven't re we re relied solely on our air force and our boys and they really did a good job i think israel's small force of jets struck first at every arab base where the superior russian mig 21s and the sam ground to air missiles were based the Israelis swept out to sea and came in low under the Arab radar, equipped with new and highly secret bombs. The chief of staff of the Israeli armed forces tonight called the success of the Israeli Air Force in today's action an achievement without precedent. Major General Rabin claimed that the Israeli Air Force today struck what he termed a devastating blow at the air forces of Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. Israel is claiming that 374 enemy aircraft were destroyed in today's action, all but 20 of them in attacks on enemy airfields while the aircraft were still on the ground. Of this total, 1st strikes were aimed at destroying the fighters and putting Arab bases out of action with new bombs designed by the Israelis to drop vertically like darts. Time bombs were later planted on Arab runways to prevent the repair of damage. Thus Israel secured the essential ingredient for victory, total control of the Middle East skies. They said it was napalm, and it looks like napalm, and some of the worst cases appeared to be beyond pain. I conducted a tour of Helmia Military Hospital, one of several such institutions on the fringe of the city, revealed two wards jam-packed with burn cases, all of them, it was said, the result of being hit by the flaming jelly. In each ward, approximately 60 patients. They're caught, three abreast, and perhaps 15 inches apart at best. There appeared to be a shortage of nurses, and most of those on duty hovered about the 10 or 12 severely burned soldiers in each of the wards. Some of the medical equipment boasted U.S. markings. Another victim was the United States naval vessel Liberty. She was mistaken for an Egyptian vessel, and Israeli ships and planes torpedoed and strafed her. The casualties were high, 34 American dead and 75 wounded. There were arguments later about how the error happened, and the best explanation seemed to be the urge felt by all Israeli forces to win a quick victory. There was little time to check targets. Pilots were flying seven and eight missions a day. The Liberty was just 12 miles from the Sinai Peninsula, where the speed and ferocity of the Israeli land operations caught everyone by surprise. Israel's first military objective was to destroy Egyptian forces in Gaza and strike for the Suez Canal. The fight for Gaza followed immediately upon the airstrike. The buffer zone was one of three vital gateways to the Suez Canal. Here, Egypt had placed the best armor units immediately after the withdrawal of United Nations peacekeeping forces. These Egyptian regulars were supported by the Palestine Liberation Army, whose leaders were trained in Peking. 
The strip, only 25 miles in length, was heavily fortified with landmines, barbed wire and anti-tank guns. For months, the Israeli settlements nearby had been harassed by snipers and the entire strip was regarded as a festering and highly dangerous sore. Egyptian divisions here were earmarked by President Nasser for the attack on Tel Aviv, only one hour's drive away. 15,000 Israeli troops attacked Gaza from in front and from behind. The tank commander, General Tal, led a column that fell upon the Egyptian rear. He had to destroy the enemy in Gaza within the first day in order to race to the canal, turn south, and trap the big Egyptian concentration of tanks in the central Sinai. The key to Israeli army tactics was improvisation and a readiness to fight by unconventional means whenever possible. But the road to Gaza was littered with Arabs armed and trained in guerrilla warfare. It was crammed with booby traps. And one of the many victims was a CBC cameraman, Ben Oyserman. Along this road, Oyserman stopped to remove an obstacle and was killed instantly when a mine exploded. Casualties were heavy on both sides because of the murderous nature of the fighting. Army manuals were thrown away as battalion commanders sent infantry into the streets to fight hand-to-hand -hand with armed civilians. Beyond Gaza lay the vital airbase of El Arish, where the Egyptian Eastern Air Commander had issued orders for the systematic bombing of Israeli targets. By the end of the first day, the Israelis captured El Arish and used it for their own planes on supply drops to armoured infantry further south. Six Algerian MiG-21s arrived over Gaza after the Israelis won control. They were brought down to a smooth landing and captured by Israeli Air Force officers speaking Arabic from the El Arish control tower. The greatest danger after Gaza was occupied came from Arabs of the Palestine Liberation Army. For years they were taught to hate the Jews, and recently they'd been instructed by the communist Chinese in the vicious arts of sabotage, terrorism, and underground warfare. For days it was dangerous to wander through Gaza without a military escort. And yet this was the region patrolled and protected by the United Nations as a buffer between Israel and Egypt. The Star of David flew above Gaza before nightfall on that very first day. Arab prisoners were searched and their weapons immediately taken over by Israelis, acutely conscious of their own shortage of guns and ammunition. <laughs> The prisoners complained the Israelis did not fight according to the textbook. An Israeli commander replied that of course textbooks were very useful for sanitary purposes. In fact, the fight for Gaza was a struggle between Israelis dedicated to the unconventional and the unexpected, and Arab commanders who fought in conventional ways and in accordance with Russian textbooks on static defense. Arabs in civilian clothes were in some cases treated as prisoners of war because they were found carrying arms supplied by the so-called Liberation Army of Palestine. One of nine Egyptian generals taken prisoner in the Sinai was the former governor of Gaza. He was ambushed as he fled towards Cairo. I was on my way back to Cairo, and on the route, fire was opened on my car. I was hit in the thigh. 
uh, three bullets and a splinter. So the car was put out of action and I was captured on the route. The general said he trained in Russia, but he was disappointed Russia had failed to help Egypt, except in the supply of Russian arms. Uh, our president's decisions were supposed by all of us to be true and good decisions for the country. And we were supposed as we were told, and according to our own planning, to go into Sinai to stop any aggression. The main action was in the Sinai. Here, NASA assembled his best troops and the biggest tanks. Here, on the Mittler Pass, took place a clash of arms on a scale never before witnessed in such a small arena. Only one man in each Israeli tank crew was a regular soldier. The rest were reservists who drove out by car and bus. Their orders were to keep attacking, never stop, drive through the main routes across the Sinai and destroy as much Egyptian armor as they could, and to prevent an Egyptian retreat back upon the Suez Canal. Here Israel pitted her World War II armor against the very latest of the ponderous Russian Stalin tanks. Supporting the Israelis, however, were their own strike pilots, flying as many as 10 missions a day now, and depending often on nothing more than 30 millimeter cannon, because the jets had already exhausted their main bomb supplies. They were supported by mobile howitzers. The Sinai offensive threw heavily on the Israeli reserves of ingenuity and imagination. The Egyptians had sunk many of their tanks into the desert, turning them into immobile gun infants they formed a kind of Maginot line which Israel had to smash. So surprise and speed were the essential, and these Israeli armor columns shot through Egyptian lines and attacked from behind, attacked, said an Egyptian tank commander, from the wrong direction. Each Israeli column was capable of ranging across the desert like a small navy, living off its own fat. The infantry were trained to run for miles across the desert without stopping. Each soldier was trained to do another man's job Many took over captured Arab tanks and half tracks, using these Russian weapons to back up their own armor. Many Russian weapons were used in action for the first time by the Israelis who'd captured them. A joke was born in the Sinai. President Nasser was said, telephoned Moscow for more arms. Sure, said the Russians, but what does General Diane need? The heaviest fighting was here in the Mittler Pass. Here the battle turned into one of history's epic engagements of armor. It lasted 24 hours, and some 1,000 tanks clashed in a narrow defile less than 15 miles long, the Mittler Pass by which Egyptians tried to escape back to the Suez Canal. By Wednesday, there was virtually no Egyptian army left to fight. 100,000 Egyptians were dead, captured, or on the run. 900 Russian tanks were destroyed, captured, or already in Israeli repair shops. The problem of disposing of the dead and disarmed Arabs was tremendous. Israel's resources were so limited that all her attention was focused on winning the war and looking after her own wounded. The generals had calculated they had enough manpower and equipment to fight a preventive campaign lasting no more than 10 days, but inside 90 hours they'd captured the whole of Sinai. There were very few helicopters available, and thousands of wounded littered the desert like survivors at sea. If they tried to move, they faced death from thirst and heat. Soldiers found time to pray, but the orders were still the same. Keep moving, don't stop, drive for the Suez Canal. Israel was determined to secure her borders east of Suez, and her troops meant to capture all the territory they could before the United Nations recovered its wits and ordered a ceasefire. The canal was a military symbol of success. Israeli commanders believed their country would never be safe, while Egypt was free to use the canal as a political weapon. Arab resistance had almost collapsed, yet some of the men had fought like tigers. 
one Egyptian tank made it through the desert and then was hit and landed with one tread in the water at Suez. Egyptian troops were forced to throw away helmets and boots as they made the long, terrible trek home. They had been defeated in the biblical wilderness of Zin, and it was here Moses was said to have led his people out of Egypt long ago. Occupied with the fighting on other fronts, Israeli army commanders tried to drop the defeated Arabs supplies of water, but it was still the middle of the Six-Day War, and Israel had neither time nor provisions to help the smashed armies in the Sinai. Israel had achieved a feat of arms in this terrible wilderness under the blazing sun. Perhaps the full story will never be known. Parts of it were told later by Egyptian prisoners who were taken to the Suez Canal and ferried across it to home. Israeli commanders were upset by reports of ill-treatment. They were still fighting for their own lives and still they had to care for thousands of Egyptians, many of them ill from exhaustion and thirst. Nothing was done by President Nasser to help the broken Egyptian armies. Nothing was done by Russia to help the forces she had armed so heavily. But there was an absence of vindictiveness among Israel's forces as the Arabs filed into the prison compounds. There was, for sure, pity for the prisoners, and there was anger at the way Egyptians in particular had been deceived. For many prisoners believed Nasser's claim they'd be executed by the Jews and many prisoners were surprised at the absence of Russian military support. The mass surrenders were the most eloquent proof that the ordinary Arab never had much to hope for when his leaders chose war instead of peace, in an arms race that wasted billions of dollars in a region desperately in need of economic aid. weapons littered the desert for miles. An Israeli tank commander said bitterly it had been like giving an illiterate beggar a golden fountain pen to arm Egyptians with jets and rockets and tanks. Russian SAM-2 guideline surface-to-air missiles were captured within range of Tel Aviv. Ten were still on their launchers, unused. Israeli troops performed a small war dance on one, and they could hardly be blamed. The presence of modern Russian guns and rockets had been frightening. Everyone expected to suffer heavy casualties from their use by Arab operators. This Russian missile base was only 50 miles from Jerusalem, and it was captured intact. The first SAM-2 Russian base to fall into unfriendly hands. Meanwhile, the blockade of the Gulf of Aqaba was broken almost by accident. Sharm El Sheikh was the Egyptian garrison and Israeli patrol boats raced south from Elat to find the Arabs had already gone. It was the third day of war, and a few Egyptian soldiers were found in the surrounding wasteland. The paratroopers who expected to fight for Sharm El Sheikh landed with ease. Ironically, the very first ship to sail into the Gulf of Aqaba was Russian and entered by courtesy of the new Israeli garrison. 
On the fourth day of war, the fighting against Egypt was stopped by the UN ceasefire. Now it was Syria's turn. Israeli troops mortared the Arabs' position. Then the infantry, supported by armor, attacked across the border on June the 9th and climbed the Syrian heights. Their objective was the string of Syrian fortifications 3,000 feet above the plain of Galilee. Here, the Syrian guns had blasted away at Israel's border settlements for months and years on end. The normally mild-mannered Israeli Prime Minister told me later, we had to teach the Syrians a lesson they would never forget. And so Israel's jets and tanks struck again. This time they came as invaders, but again their objectives were limited by their own self-discipline. They wanted to destroy the big Russian-made guns assembled on the Syrian frontier, and as they attacked, tape recordings were made of Russian voices broadcasting orders to the Syrian gunners. One armor brigade split up and once more used the tactics of swift and unexpected attacks from behind the Syrian lines. On the fifth day of war, Syria was also saved by the ceasefire. When the Israeli army redrew the map of the Middle East, this barren, rocky, windy knoll is where they stopped in Syria. It's just 17 miles down that road to Damascus. It's 15 miles in that direction to the old Israeli-Syrian frontier. Once the Israelis gained a foothold on the mountain, the Syrians panicked, leaving the road strewn with Russian equipment, trucks, jeeps, and tanks. One crew even left the key in the ignition of the tank. The Israelis drove 15 miles into Syria, past the town of Kenetra, which is now all but deserted, except for a few elderly civilians who are being closely guarded. The Israelis also took the headwaters of the Jordan River, they celebrated their victory by a wash and a drink, even as the Syrian town nearby continued to smolder. Israel paid a heavy price for its chunk of Syria, and she intends to keep it. They say nothing will entice her into letting the Syrians return to their hillside fortress, from which they can shell Israel's borders with impunity. All across Israeli-occupied territories, tens of thousands of refugees are on the move. These are the remains of the Allenby Bridge over the Jordan River, the eastern extremity of the Israeli advance into the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. In the last few days, between 50 and 100,000 refugees have fled across this bridge. In most cases, they've been fleeing from hunger and disease on one side of the Jordan to hunger and disease on the other. The large part of these refugees are Palestinian Arabs, people who've been homeless and stateless not just since this month's war, but since the state of Israel was carved out 19 years ago. Jordanian and Egyptian authorities did little to integrate them into national life because, for propaganda purposes, the refugees could be pointed to as evidence of the injustice of Israel's border settlement. Now, on the refugee road to the border, the most the Palestinian Arabs can look forward to is the probability of another generation on the dole. Their lot isn't likely to be changed whether Israel hangs on to the West Bank or, more likely, returns it to Jordan for other concessions. In fact, the refugees probably made a bad mistake in deserting in large numbers the UN-sponsored camps on the West Bank where many were assured a shelter and subsistence diet. They certainly have nothing to fear from Israel's occupying troops other than the occasional roadside search for hidden arms. Yet hungry, thirsty, exhausted, they continue to flee to the Jordan in this the hottest, driest part of the world. As one UN relief official put it, the refugees are the biggest losers of the war. David Holton, CBC News on the Jordan River. As we appealed to King Hussein and to other neighbors to stay their hand and Israel would do likewise. However, Jordan joined in this Egyptian attack and opened a concerted shell fire on Jerusalem and on all villages along the Jordan border. We were left no choice but to fight for our land and our lives. 
at Jerusalem's Hadassah Hospital, more than 1,500 cases have been treated. And doctors are still working around the clock to operate on the seriously wounded. Helping out are volunteer surgeons and nurses who've flown in from all over the world. Among half a dozen Canadians here is Dr. David Deckelbaum of Montreal. It was incredible. They started bringing in hundreds of wounded by uh, ambulance and also by helicopter. There's a helicopter landing field over there. Was the hospital and, uh, being shelled at this point? The hospital, no, the hospital was shelled earlier uh, on Monday. It, the shelling started here about half past 11 Monday morning and finished after about one, one hour, two hours. The battle for Jerusalem was the dirtiest of the war, violent shelling followed by fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting through Arab streets. But Israel was bent upon taking the old city of Jerusalem, which had been denied the Jews by its former Arab occupants. The entire force that fought against Jordan was a reserve force. All our regulars were down in the Sinai. The uh, paratroopers broke in at St. Stephen's Gate and at the Dung Gate, two of the important gates leading into the city. And uh, at that point, uh, Arab opposition broke down. And by 10.15 in the morning, on the Wednesday morning, of the 7th of June, 1967, our troops were at the holiest of places for the Jewish people, the Wailing Wall. Israeli soldiers advanced upon the Wailing Wall under the whining bullets of snipers. Danger lurked at every corner, in each doorway, behind every window, in the narrow winding streets of the Arab Quarter. Many were killed in these alleyways where Arab legionnaires fought first with guns and grenades and finally with knives and broken bottles. The wall was all that remained of the second Temple of Solomon and for centuries the Jews had bewailed its loss. It represented more than a military objective. It was the source of Jewish faith and hope. Men dropped their guns and stood to pray, some smiling quietly in the belief that justice had at last been done some weeping and blinded by tears. General Diane and other commanders hastened to the wall in the midst of battle. Guards watched the snipers. Diane, a man unaccustomed to displays of religious fervor, put a scrap of paper, a prayer, into the chinks in the wall, like any other Jewish pilgrim. We who were there knew this scene would be written into legend and go down in history as a great and piquant moment in the entire human tragedy. There can be no return to the situation that existed here before June 5th. The people of Israel is not prepared to go back to the so-called armistice uh, or the armistice regime initiated in 1949, which was uh, not an armistice at all. Through the unilateral choice of the Arab government, it turned out to be a continuous state of terror, infiltration, threats, and preparations for full-scale war. I am sure uh, that uh, uh, if it were up to the peoples of the neighboring Arab states, they too would prefer the improvement of their agriculture, commerce, and industry, uh, and uh, the uh, initiation of an era of uh, peace and tranquility. Once we begin to look in this direction, the possibilities are almost limitless. Less than a week after the war began, pilgrims passed through Jerusalem to the wall of the Second Temple. Snipers were still at their deadly work, but the people rejoiced and showed no fear, nor any hatred for the Arabs whose leaders had promised to kill them. It seemed to an outsider as if the legend of the wandering Jew had come to its rightful conclusion. The war had been fought reluctantly, without bravado or bombast, 
It ended in dignity, without scenes of jubilation, in an atmosphere of prayer and thanksgiving. Many of the soldiers who fought and died had never known a time when their existence was not threatened. This time they had struck back before the massacre began, and their hearts were lifted up by the song which, by some strange gift of fate, became popular on the very eve of this terrible and strange war of survival. The song expressed the yearning felt by millions of Jews for a place, a land, a small corner of the world they could call their own. The song was called Jerusalem of Gold. <laughs> 